Deacon Sandoval is assigned to the Cathedral of St. Mary of the Assumption in the Archdiocese of San Francisco. He is uh, a mental health professional who has had much experience in the area over many decades, and he works now for the Westside Community Service, the largest mental health provider in San Francisco, as director of the Community Services Division. He's a pioneer in the pursuit of breaking down the walls between spiritual care, mental care, and physical care. In his ministry as deacon in the Archdiocese of San Francisco, he is, uh, and we'll pray two prayers together. Well, the second one is in the first person, and I will be speaking it, but please speak it and pray it as if it's from your own lips and your own heart. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Soul of Christ, sanctify me. Body of Christ, save me. Blood of Christ, inebriate me. Water from the side of Christ, wash me. Passion of Christ, strengthen me. O oh, good Jesus, hear me. Within your wounds, hide me. Let me never be separated from you. From the malicious enemy, defend me. In the hour of my death, call me. And bid me to come unto you, that I may praise you with your saints and with your angels forever and ever. Amen. Spirit of our God and Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Most Holy Trinity, Immaculate Virgin Mary, angels, archangels, and saints of heaven, descend upon me. Please purify me. Lord, mold me. Fill me with yourself. Use me. Banish from me all the forces of evil. Destroy them. Vanquish them so that I can be healthy and do good deeds. Banish from me all spells, witchcraft, black magic, malefic ties, maledictions, and the evil eye, diabolic infants infestations, oppressions, possessions, all that is evil and sinful, jealousy, verity, envy, physical, psychological, moral, spiritual, and diabolical ailments. Burn all these evils in hell, that they may never again touch me or any other creature in the entire world. I command and bid all the powers that molest me by the power of God, all-powerful, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, through the intercession of the Immaculate Virgin Mary, to leave me forever, and to be consigned into everlasting hell, where they will be bound by St. Michael, St. Raphael, our guardian angels, and their will they will be crushed under the heel of the Immaculate Virgin Mary. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Vade retro santina, be gone, Satan. These are the words of the exorcist. He is the one who, in the holy name of Jesus, by the power of the Father and the Spirit, cast out the demons of spiritual affliction. Part of my work as a professional in mental health is to try to discern ailments that affect a person, spirit, mind, and body. There is a direct correlation that's intertwined between spiritual care, mental care, and physical care. In our life journey, all of us will experience symptoms of all those things. For we are whole, we are both body and soul. The opportunity for me to step up to go to this session was uncanny. Of course, the Spirit of God impels me to move in, in a direction when I pray, Thy will be done. I was uh, excited to go. I was one of uh, 176 participants from 26 different countries. My ministries at the cathedral include uh, Strength for the Journey, working with people with life-threatening illness, and I do the grief and bereavement ministry as well. I have a long history of been, having been at the bedside, and I had a particular uh, experience in working during the AIDS epidemic when people were dying to my left and to my right in the midst of this terrible pandemic that took many people, young and old. So this evening, I pray that each of you can harvest the insights that I have gathered uh, in Rome. And as we begin to have this conversation, I would ask you to become evangelizers of the message and begin to take in the insights for yourselves, for your families, for your communities, 
and for all of those around you. So let us begin. Jesus is not one of many ways to approach God, nor is he the best of several ways. He is the only way. A very faith, uh, one of my favorite authors is uh, C.S. Lewis, who said, where is the knowledge and information? And where is the wisdom and knowledge? And when we begin to teach and impart, it's critical that we not just offer our, the holy people of God information or specific knowledge, but wisdom teaching from the, from, from the fathers and mothers of the church. And so that is what we will do today. Let no one be found among you who sacrifices his son or daughter in the fire, who practices divination or sorcery, interprets omens, engages in witchcraft or casts spells, or is a medium or a spiritist, or who consults the dead. Anyone who does these things is detestable to the Lord. Deuteronomy. Slide. As we begin to see the beginning of the story of mankind, much of our battle with, between good and evil is rooted in the fall. Man's fall contains a seductive voice, the voice of a fallen angel called Satan, or the devil. The church teaches that Satan and other demons were created good by God, but they became evil by their own doing. This is the Fourth Lateran Council. These demons were made these demons made a free, irrevocable choice to reject God. This rebellion is reflected in the tempter's word, you will be like God. So while it is important for us to lift up our faith and to focus on our Lord, on the Trinity, our God of love, it's also important to know who it is that we are in combat with and why. Having sinned from the beginning, the devil is now the father of lies. God's mercy toward these fallen angels is useless. Their sin is unforgivable because their choice is ir irrevocable. Now hear this and take this in. There is no repentance for the angel, the fallen angels, just as there is no repentance for men after death. This is St. John Damascene, one of our ancient fathers, one of our ancient doctors of the church. Hundreds of years ago, this insight was gathered even then. But we live in a culture, in a country, in an environment in which communication and discussions and dialogues like this are poo-pooed and pushed aside. Slide. Ephesians tells us, For you were once in darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of the light. For the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but expose them. If you hold your tongue, silence is agreement. When you see sin against the innocent, against the neighbor, against a family member, and you do not speak the words of our Lord, you live in darkness. Slide. So what about the ministries of Jesus? The threefold ministry of Jesus. He preached the gospel. He healed the sick. And he cast out demons. We in the clergy and the lay community are very good, I think, to preach the gospel. I think we do it quite well. We proclaim the gospel in the ways that we, from, from the ambo, and from the dinner table, and in our newspapers, we speak the gospel. We try to address issues of healing in hospitals as chaplains, in support groups within our church structures, in ways that we engage people who are sick. We are not doing the third piece. We are not stepping up to begin to address this. He also casts out demons. The scriptural passage that supports this idea of this ministry is this. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, 
and healing all manner of sickness and every infirmity among the people. And his fame went throughout all Syria, and they presented him all sick people that were taken with diverse diseases and torments, and such as were possessed by devils and lunatics, and those that had palsy, and he cured them. Slide. What is exorcism, precisely? There's some confusion. I, I, we have some of the fathers sitting here, and, and they will remember from seminary these words. I see that my language sort of slipped, but that's OK. The first word that you see up there is exorcism. These are interchangeable words. Solemn exorcism, major exorcism, imperative prayer. Uh, the reason I raise that is because sometimes you hear the words used interchangeably. And uh, it's hard to wrap your head around it. But suffice it to say, that exorcism is the right in which the church asks publicly and authoritatively in the name of Jesus Christ that a person or object be protected against the power of the evil one and withdrawn from his dominion. Exorcism is directed at the expulsion of demons or to the liberation from demonic possession through the spiritual authority which Jesus entrusted to his church. San Isidro in the seventh century said, exorcism is a word of invocation against the unclean spirit present in the possessed. And finally, it's very directly speaking to the demon or the legion of demons inside of a person. In exorcism, the exorcist states a direct command. I command you to go away when speaking directly to the devil or his demons. Slide. Aha, uh -huh. here's another word. This is different. This is a completely different piece, and this is for our empowerment in the room. St. Justin said, this power of Christians demonstrates the truth of Christianity. When shamans fail, Christians succeed. Is that true today? The prayer of liberation is a prayer invoking God's power or protection through the intercession of our Lord Jesus, the most blessed Virgin Mary, the angels and the saints, to be delivered from Lucifer and his legion. Mark 16, 7 through 17 through 18 is the scriptural basis for the prayer of liberation. Listen carefully. In my name they will cast out demons, speak new languages, take serpents in their hands, heal the sick. And Jesus is speaking of those who believe in me. It does not just say priests, bishops, or mystics, but those who believe in me in general. Again, the same thing here. The prayer of liberation is not common in the American dialect of English, but I want you to memorize this. This is really critical for our own spiritual health. Words that are used interchangeably and related to each other, the prayer of liberation, minor exorcism, and many of the clergy will understand this, but we use this in in baptism, for example. Prayers of deliverance, deprecative pr prayer, and intercessory prayer, all related, more accurate to say. I think the, 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 the fakers and movers at the Vatican really feel that the terminology should be prayer of liberation. Are there prayers plural of liberation? Yes, there's many. Slide. What are we up against? We hear Holy Fathers during our lifetime especially John Paul II and Benedict and now Francis speak about the culture of death and the culture of life. Let's look at it a little closer. What do we mean by the culture of death? And this is an incomplete list. Frankly, in the area of uh, prayers of liberation and deliverance ministry, I think there is, we can safely see that there's lack of seminary formation. Now there may be a priest or a deacon among us here who may have had some. But it's been my experience that that has not been the case. Lack of sensitivity in the Catholic clergy. And I'm talking the Church Universal. So uh, what the, uh, the Vatican is attempting to do is to really lift up the profile around educating people about this. I think it's safe to say that the American culture is about speed, super superficiality, and selfishness. Sounds like it's very judgmental, but I think I would be safe to say that, that the common thread 
in this instantaneous society is this. The issue of double belonging, what does that mean? Well, I'm a Catholic Christian, but I, I do listen to the horoscope. I, I'm a Catholic Christian, but I like to do tarot cards. I'm a Catholic Christian, but I like to do yoga and do the Hindi Sanskrit uh, language that goes with it. We got some problems with this idea of double belonging, or triple belonging, or quadruple belonging. New cult movements in the country. We'll talk about that later. Hostile secularism, which rejects God, his gospel, and all things religious. And it would, be, would it be safe to say that we have a pornography pandemic in the country? And in the world? It is insidious. It seeks to seduce all people. Promotion of illegitimate sexual deviancies with children, animals, multiple partners of men, women, and transgenders. We were having a conversation offline earlier that there is now a movement in some cities across the country for a group marriage where men and women in groups want to marry each other and live together as married groups. There's also the issue of people becoming by species, incorporating relationships and intimacy with animals. This is what, what is happening here. The normalization of the use of drugs and alcohol in the West in the pursuit of money and power. Have you seen the normalization of drugs for recreational use in this country? Very recently, the climate of relativism is challenging the moral teaching of our church. And of course, an assault on the building blocks of culture, the culture of commitment, which is family, church, and community. But all is not lost. <laughs> we do have the good news. We are on the move. Holy Mother Church is on the move. OK. Pope Francis is relaunching the culture of love. Would you agree? Yes. Yay. Pope John Paul II's ongoing call for an exorcist in every diocese worldwide is proceeding, hence the training at the Regina Apostolorum. This is critical for us to try to get teaching and people that can really deal with those hardcore issues. We're beginning to recover our Catholic anthropology. What does that mean? That the legacy of the teaching of the church for centuries that have been put aside the spiritual treasure is being taken out of the dark rooms and lifted on high. And I am so pleased to be in your parish where the Dominican community, loyal to the magisterium, is, is bringing the treasure forward to all of the believers here. Ongoing response to the clergy pedophilia scandal. We're not done there. We we'll continue to do cleanup around that. And even though it's 1% or, or 1% to 2%, depending on the location, the, 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 the damage to the church and its credibility by those that are enemies of the church is being fanned into a flame that is massive. And they're trying to extract money and damaging the credibility of our church. But internally, we've got to make sure that we defend those that are innocent, both clergy who did nothing, and of course to protect our children from those kinds of acts, which are Totally inexcusable. Breaking down the walls between spiritual care, mental care, and physical care. All of us are going to wind up in hospitals. Most of us, I, I, I preached to you over the weekend about the, the issue of the journey of life. We need to break down the, uh, the, uh, these walls, compartmentalizing these pieces. I tell my members of the clergy, both for Catholics and non-Catholics in the interfaith world, that that which you have been trained to do should be brought to the bedside. You don't need to be a, a psychologist or a physician. The, the, the same thing with the physician, the, the psychologist needs to bring their, their expertise to the table, as well as the doctors. We have to work in, t in tandem. And also, we be need, need to begin to understand that while we lead, the, the Roman Catholic Church leads the interfaith movement, we have had three worldwide gatherings of interfaith leaders uh, hosted and convened by the Roman Catholic Church. And yet, we must understand that neo-paganism, voodoo, witchcraft, satanic cults, and New Age sects are not part of this interfaith community. Many of them choose to do harm to others and to self. They are not legitimate. 
We must draw a boundary. Not okay. And, you know, and, and as we get closer to the, the end of the list, the Universal Church has drawn a, fu a fire line to rebuild the system of reference to Judeo-Christian core values and the recovery of the church, family, and community. And in many parts of the country now, people are beginning to emerge with prayer of liberation ministries at the local level, which I find very useful. The problem with us is when we remain silent again within families, within workplaces, uh, in, in diverse environments in which the church and our faith is assaulted and we sit there and we sit there in silence and, oh, I gotta get out of here, I don't know how to answer that. That paralysis is not useful. We must defend ourselves. Next. Okay, let's look at the Ministry of Exorcism. Okay, I can see what the slides are happening here. Uh, this should have been bigger. Okay. The ministry of the exorcist should be carried out in humility and trust under the authority of the bishop of the diocese. There's one man who will be appointed by the local bishop to do exorcisms. One man. The priest must have a God-given charism that includes four qualities. Piety, knowledge, prudence, and a quality of life to be in good standing. A license by a bishop to perform an exorcism can be orally given, but it is better if it's, it is written. Exorcism is a sacramental. We must put on the mind of Christ. The devil knows our psyche. He studies us. And the most effective form of exorcism is, the, is in the old Roman ritual, the 1710 version. And I guess I am speaking to some of the priests here that are, 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 are among us. It is most helpful if the exorcist builds a transdisciplinary team to include a mental health professional, a physician, and the, and the lay faithful as prayer warriors. This will give him additional diagnostic tools. Quotation. Who is that man who's issuing that quotation? That could be someone I know. The fathers of the church were not stupid or less illuminated. The church teaches by building on continuity, not by the annulment of legacy. Let us settle that question now. I see a lot of confusion. Well, that, we're, you know, we're post-Vatican II. All that stuff that we did back there, well, that's garbage. We put that in the attic. Wrong. This is wrong. It is the, the to legacy and continuity is the summary of, of over 2,000 years of Christianity. Let us be clear about that. In Italy, there are some 500,000 visits are made by 200 to 300 exorcists. That sounds pretty good. No? However, there are 12 million visits to psychics, wizards, magicians, or witches. Look at the, the, the proportion here. This is by their calculations in Italy. The, 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 the place where we have the Holy See. Slide. Ministry of Liberation. Now here's some interesting good news. Here's how we can participate, you and I, from this night forward. The Ministry of Liberation. The baptized, the bishops, priests, and deacons among the ordained, brothers, sisters, nuns, hermits, perpetual virgins among the professed, and the lay faithful may utilize the prayer of liberation for private use. What does that mean? To ask the Lord to do the free. Doesn't mean that I do the free, the Lord does the free. To petition. There is, as I have said to you over the weekend, there is, the invocation of prayer is an opportunity to invoke a response. God, his angels, and his saints, and the Blessed Mother are ready to respond if you petition and ask for that response. The prayers of exorcism, oh, what the examples are St. Patrick's breastplate, I think some of you know that. Prayer of St. Michael is a very good example. Who knows the prayer of St. Michael? Yay. Yay. Invoking the holy name of Jesus in some kind of emergency. We don't have time to do all the words of the other one. Jesus. Let us hear it. Jesus. Say it from your hearts. Jesus. Very good. Prayers of exorcism like the ritual of Leo the Thirteenth, may be used only by a bishop appointed exorcist who is high priest. I, I mean, I'm sorry, who's appointed by the, uh, who is the priest on high, I should say by singular virtue authorized by a specific diocese only. And does anyone know what the Leo the Thirteenth prayer is? Yes. Father, you want to just t t tell people just the beginning of the prayer for us? 
No, just to give, just because some people are using the prayer. Just say a few words about it. Well, I, I don't. Uh, well, the the prayer by Leo the Thirteenth is a quite long prayer, uh, and it can be used privately by anyone, but you have to take certain parts out of it. There are certain parts in parentheses that you can't use, isn't that no, right? you can't use that at all. You can't use it at all? No. No. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. Well, that very, I didn't mean to put him on the spot. I didn't mean to put him on the spot. I didn't mean to put him on the spot, and, and I'm going to get to that prayer here. And how many of you know the, the prayer of Leo the Thirteenth? Anybody? Oh, you have a copy? I don't have it. Okay. I'm going to go through it in a minute. And I'll tell you why in a moment. I'm going to get to that point. Okay. Well, that was an interesting teachable moment. <laughs> okay. Okay. Now, oh, we're getting to it right now. We cannot add or take away words from formulas to justify the use of prayers of exorcism. However, the prayers of liberation may be modified. That is considered a prayer of exorcism. Therefore, you cannot, again, do not re-spin the prayer by removing certain parts of it. And that's critical for clergy to know that. It's been in circulation for many years and people think, thought that they were doing something wonderful. But we're understanding that absolute obedience to the magisterium is critical in order to be effective. But prayers of liberation you can modify, okay? What is critical for, uh, uh, for those doing deliverance ministries is obedience. Absolute obedience to the church will make all the endeavors more spiritually successful in virtually all cases. Now here's some interesting data. Exorcism is used in 10% of all cases, very effectively. Prayers of liberation are used in 90% of all cases and is 90% effective. What does that mean? Are we taking our baptismal sacrament and the strength of that to pray for others to be delivered from spiritual affliction? Can we pray to our Lord, to, to St. Joseph, to the Blessed Mother and the angels of the saints to have somebody to be delivered from, from spiritual affliction? You should feel empowered by this, that you have the power to pray this, prayers of liberation. Okay. Cults are at the service of Satan. These people seek power and future knowledge or other hidden knowledge and will seek to destroy both the exorcist and the liberator. The exorcist uses the prayers of exorcism. The liberator uses the prayer of liberation. A deliverance ministry team should include priests and deacons, psychologists and psychiatrists, physicians and prayer warriors of, of the lay faithful. In both the prayer of exorcism and the prayer of liberation, it is not us that frees, but who? The Lord. The Lord. Know that. And be careful for those people that are walking around like celebrity, cult celebrities, like they're the ones that are doing the work. They're not doing the work. Our Lord is doing the work. Slide. Ah, that's dark. Okay, this is what I said to you in the homily. One, one true deadly power in Satan's artillery is that Satan fights like hell to keep us sinning and to keep us away from the one who forgives sin. If you notice across the country there has been a decline in people attending or experiencing or entering into the sacrament of reconciliation. How dangerous is that to the Catholic world? Think about this, folks. Do you have children, brothers and sisters, neighbors, go to Mass? Oh, I haven't been in confession in six months. Oh, in two years. And you know they're walking around possibly in mortal sin. To keep us sinning and to keep us away from, the, 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 from sacramental confession, that is problematic. The sacrament of divine mercy awaits us. Jesus himself will forgive your sins and strengthen you for, uh, on, on the journey. Next. Okay, here we go. Okay. The six strategies of Satan. Now let's, there's a lot of words here, so I just want you to not memorize the words, I just want you to listen to the meaning of this, these things. Temptation. Unhealthy attraction to things that will separate us from God's love and His commandments. This includes the pursuit of money, power, recognition, and titles 
at the expense of others through the practice of deception and toxic gossip. The pursuit of carnal curiosities like pornography, drunkenness, drug use, and unholy company will also lure us away from God. Anybody in this room not tempted? Oh, come on. There's, there's got to be a saint here. Even the saints were tempted, no? Oppression, sometimes op uh, the word is used interchangeably with obsession, is a diabolic assault on the mind from the outside. Oftentimes as a, a, a professional working in the mental health institution, I'm sometimes called to discern the difference between mental health and the assaults of the evil one. Obsession springing from the prince of darkness is real, which may lead to suicide, clinical depression, and hurting self and others. The obsessed often hears voices that blaspheme and scream in their heads. I was involved with law enforcement in San Francisco uh, last year where there was a young man of age, I would say he was about 12 or 13. He was an A student, went to Catholic school. He had a good friend who was a young woman. Uh, they would go to the movies together. Uh, he was an altar boy. And uh, they were making up plans to, to get together to, uh, the next morning to walk to school together. Uh, as, he, uh, as the parents start to look for him, they go into the bedroom and he's missing. The bed hasn't been slept in. And they start, they became frantic and they start looking every place. They couldn't find him. And finally the mother went outside and the boy was hanging from, our, from the window of the second floor of their home. The grandmother comes to me and she says, there's no way, no how. This young man did not keep it on unholy company. He was a holy young man. She suspected some kind of curse that was placed on the boy and on the family. And that somehow he wound up committing suicide at the, at the suggestion of this curse. And to this day, the San Francisco Police Department has not solved this case. The profile does not fit. Do you hear what I'm telling you? And how do we, who live in a world in which measurements and logic, uh, uh, deductive reasoning rules the environment, and yet this possibility that someone may have placed a curse on the family and caused this fatality is not considered. Next, possession. Demons take control of the mind and body from the inside of a person, but remember, not the soul. Satan cannot control the will. He can, however, assault the will with simultaneous temptation and obsession to create chaos. The church works closely with all the healing professions to determine cause and effect before it resorts to the exorcism rite. Now here's something from Pope Paul VI. Listen to Pope Paul VI's description here. The devil is a being that carries out dark actions, penetrating the world and the church. Aha! You think you're safe in the church? You think, are we safe from attack, you think? And the church, he is our enemy, and enemies hide. He is an actor. Evil is not just something lacking or a privation of good, but evil is a living, perverted, spiritual being. From Holy Father, Pope Paul VI. Is that still true? Or have we evolved into a more sophisticated society where he might just have been... Oh yeah, he's a holy man, but is he really telling us the truth? There are some in our pews, some in our seminaries that would doubt his observation. Next. I wish this was a better contrast, but this is a very interesting thing. Thomas Aquinas, a great Dominican? <laughs> the faith of a person practically cancels out Satan. Here are the three other uh, assaults. Infestation, contamination through a deliberate invitation to a house, place of work, or a location with the use of an object or an animal sacrifice, consecrating that the specific space to Satan. Diabolical contagion occurs through incantations, sacrifices, and ritualistic practices, and by people who employ tarot card readers, mediums, occult seers, Ouija boards, voodoo, to cast spells, curses, and hexes. Now, is the deacon full of frijoles? <laughs> Rosarita, specifically. No. 
Am I imagining this stuff? I mean, I mean is this sci-fi? This is television. Come on. This is Steven Spielberg stuff. No? Twilight Zone? Does this happen here in the city? Yes. Another one. Disturbance is a physical assault. Beatings and maulings have been commonplace among many of our saints at blessed and venerables. Padre Pio was beaten repeatedly and thrown out of bed, for example. There can be demons who can have an impact on the body. A friend of mine who has now come back to the church decided that she was going to join a religious community in India. And as she is walking down the steps, she feels a force not only knock her to the ground, but she slides for 15, 20 feet with the face up against the dirt. <coughs> she came home. <laughs> Vexation is like the story of Job in the Holy Scripture. The evil one may attack people around us to destroy our family, our job, our house, our health, our reputation, to force us to abandon the Lord. We must be discerning about this phenomena with the help of the church and deep prayer. There are also may be social forces which may affect our personhood and our lives, which may be associated with these occurrences that are not diabolical. So we've got to be careful here. We don't want to satanize everything. However, it does raise the question about you and me when we lose our parents, brothers and sisters, children, our dog and cat, when we like lose our, our, our home, our livelihood. I hear this over and over again. Is God punishing me? Why is he doing this? I did nothing wrong. And I, and I don't want to diminish the struggle of the pain of those losses. But there are times in which that is part of the journey of life. And there are times when vexation is at play. Hence, stay close to your parish priest to discern and to your faith community to walk through those hard times with you to determine this. Slide. OK. Now this you can write, if you wish. <laughs> because these, door, these, are, these are practices that open the door to the diabolical. Here's an interesting quote. When you do not confess Christ, you confess the devil. I am, and you know, I am, a, I hope you and I are Christians, and we understand the importance of following Jesus. But here are some of the things that really opened up the door to the dark side. Curses and spells, the Ouija board, seances. Here's a big one, necromancy. Anybody know what necromancy is? It's a strange word talking to the dead. At one point in Rome, they showed a slide and a presentation in which people filled up a hotel. And in that room, they had technology in which they were promised they were going to hear the voices of those people that had passed. The room is full of 500 people. They're all waiting to hear their loved ones in a crossover. In the meantime, with these, these technological gadgets, you hear multiple voices. And trust me, they didn't sound like they were human. And when, when the panel presentation said, what does this sound like to you? There are many kinds of ways in which people try to seduce others. In, and this is obviously for money. And obviously, they're listening to something on the other side. And it may not be the sounds and voices of the angels and the saints, or your loved ones. Divination, psychic readings, magic, witchcraft, tarot card readings, and of course, all the cults. Satanic, psycho, psycho cults, new age cults. A lot of people have magic mentalities. They're looking for a short fix. Another thing that's happening in churches around the world, reported from all the different countries, is the theft of the Eucharist. And they do it in a number of different ways. One of the ways is that they, 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 they come in teams. Father goes to the back of the church to say goodbye to folks. They come up and compliment him on his homily. In the meantime, two or three go to the front, the key is in the tabernacle, to pull out the Eucharist, or to desecrate it, or to issue curses at Jesus, or to curse him. This is happening. In other cases, you have people who wear a plastic device in their mouth 
they actually receive communion from clergy, they take it on their tongue, and then they clasp this invisible plastic host holder for the black mass later. This is the part of the report out. Now, this is not happening in every church. I don't want to exaggerate. They're not, you know, you're going to be looking at your, your friends you know, lining up and say, Father Keller, does, does he have a plastic device? I mean, I don't want you to be, get, get exaggerated here. But I want you to see how far people will go. Now, these might be more exceptions than the rule, clearly. Visiting magicians, fortune tellers, faith healers, shamans, witch doctors, witches, wizards, mediums, santeros, yoruba priests, voodoo priests, and clairvoyants. Oh, but isn't it fun to go to the circus and just get my hand read? I just did it for fun. Mm -hmm. You're in for quite a ride. Other things, Freemasonry, Reiki, yoga, New Age cults, black mass, fa feng shui? No, not feng shui. Uh -huh. <laughs> Crystals. And Costco sampling of different occult practices. You know people that do that? They try different things from week to week, or month to month, or year to year. They just start jumping around testing different things. Oh yeah, this year I, I, I discovered this new shaman. Oh my god. Oh, that feng shui in my living room. Where do you think that's going? It, it's a, a way in which you determine where you position furniture based on energy fields. Now yoga, people in the course almost fell off their chairs because there was a number of people that, that did yoga for health reasons. And the exorcists and the psychiatrists both said, well, wait a minute, let's, let's break it down. In yoga, if you pursue it as a physical activity and you don't utter the Hindi or Sanskrit invocations, you're going to be okay. You're going to be okay. But do not utter language that you do not understand that invoke and the, the manifestation of dark forces. You've got to be careful with that. Yoga is okay. So I just want to make sure the yoga people here don't throw hostess cupcakes at me at the end of the session. But they were, of course, some were clergy, and of course they were concerned. But I think, I think that's the key to discernment piece on that one. Also, living in a state of sin, that makes sense. Burning the book of the gospel and profaning the Eucharist and, and the sacred in Catholic churches. Uh, there was a lot of that. There was a number of people that where people break into churches and they defecate into the, into, into the tabernacle. Outrageous things. Outrageous things. Wearing amulets dedicated to Satan. This is a partial list. Are you getting the feel for this? Okay. Slide. Ah, look at him. Uh, Pope Francis got it right. You know, he, he keeps coming out the, the first couple of months. He just kept preaching on Satan. Did you notice that? Francis was just like on it. And Francis, this is what he says, call evil by its name, Satan. Let's stop fooling around. But what's interesting to me, in spite of all the different names that he has, there's many names in, in scripture about who he is. I'm not going to go through all this list because I don't want to call him out. But I do want you to pay attention to something that was quite interesting to me and to others. And that is that envy and pride are called sins of the devil since they were involved in Satan's fall. Hmm. Let's think about this for a moment. Let's hold this in the brain for a second. Envy. In Spanish we say envidia. It really sort of takes a bite. This is <laughs> envidia. <laughs> and pride. Have you seen people in our families that we, we get into conflict with over these two issues? I mean, there's a, we got the Ten Commandments, we got the Commandments of the Church, there's all kinds of you know, variations of, on sin. But the fingerprints of Satan are right here. Major fingerprints. And he was the highest angel, the angel of light. And he took the greatest fall. <coughs> Remember that. And for those of you who that think you are close to sainthood, you're going to be canonized any second? <laughs> think we that, as my abuelita would say, be careful. Oh my God, pride. I'm a saint. I know I'm a saint. I'm going to make it. I'm going to be just like God. No, I'm going to be begging God. Be careful with this. Envy. And pride, I want you to meditate on this when you pray your rosary again, but turn this over to the Blessed Mother. When was have I been envious? And have I been doing sins of pride in my encounters with others? <laughs> Next. What about signs of Satan? They're all over the place. Uh, I'm putting a manuscript together for, for publication. I'm writing a book on these things. 
I'm not going to give you all the signs, but I just want to show you a few of them so that you get a feel for the language of people in the cults and among the Satanists. And one of the signs, which is just as grotesque as it comes, is the pontifical cross of Lucifer. This sign is used in the Satanic Bible and in Freemasonry. Now you have to tell me, adults, this is an adult session, does this not look like a cross with two testicles? And that was intentional. That's intentional. They love to take our signs, our sacred signs, and mutilate them. Another one is often used over satanic altars and symbolizes the inversion of Christian values is the cross upside down. And of course, 666 is the mark of the beast, which is used to identify the acolytes of the beast, the altar servers of the beast, those that serve Satan. And perhaps the one that you really need to pay attention to, we often see these in crime scenes, and uh, in rural areas where people go out and they do all these kinds of different rituals, the hexagram is the most powerful of all the signs of the occult. It consists of six sides, six points, and six smaller triangles, thus 666. Six, six. The book, Web of Darkness, affirms the hexagram as the most powerful and evil sign in Satanism and of all the occult, of, of the occult world. The hexagram is used mainly in witchcraft to summon demons from, from this world and beyond. <laughs> The word hex means to place a curse on someone originating with this sign. So placing a curse, oftentimes, if we ask the question, and when we are dealing with these issues, when you see spiritual afflictions, has anyone placed a curse on you that you know of or you suspect? Oftentimes this sign is placed somewhere on the person's uh, uh, home or office. Uh, we often see the sign and crime scenes, as I said. Next. How about the cults? Now, okay, so we want to look at Italy again. Or Italy. There are <laughs> 800 cults in Italy with more than 600,000 followers. Oftentimes, ex Catholic priests have offered themselves in the service of Satan, according to Catholic sources in Rome. Dios mío. I'm going to finish speaking to you in Spanish because I was shocked by this. And just when I thought I would, be, I would soon sorry for the Italians, I began to feel sorry for ourselves when I saw the rest of it. An estimated 5 to 7 million Americans have been involved in cults in the U.S. And there are 180,000 new recruits each and every year. Do you think Portland has escaped from the recruitment drive? So satanic cults, psycho cults, and new age cults have the fanatical compulsion to hijack and profane the Eucharist and Catholic rituals. And as you know, the People's Temple, where I come from, in San Francisco, the Church, the church of Satan and the People's Temple. And of course, here in beautiful Oregon, the Rajneeshis are the prominent cults in U.S. history that have inflicted tremendous loss of human life. But I also want to point out something to you about the infliction of, of, of killing on people. Remember what I said to you this Sunday. You also have to be cognizant of the fact that there is biological, physical death of the body. And there's also eternal death and damnation. His intention is to take us into the darkness in perpetuity. Be prepared to defend yourself and your families through prayer, through the sacraments. <coughs> Cults call upon Satan to manifest through the use of drugs, and rituals, and sacrifice, using menstrual, animal, and human blood in their rituals and ceremonies. Oftentimes there's consensual and non-consensual vampirism. Phallic worship and sexual perversions are the norm. Altered states of consciousness and psychosis are induced by the use of drugs and over-the-shelf medications like cough medicines, antihistamines, and muscle relaxants to disinhibit and abuse children. They can go to Walgreens and pick up their drugs to disinhibit children and to abuse them. Technology, as I said earlier, uh, is being used in necromancy. And finally, uh, initiation rites generally take place from sunset to sunrise, often accompanied by sexual orgies, abortion inducement, aphrodisiacs, and sexual stimulants. Uh, this does not paint a pretty picture. 
And, and uh, again, I, I mean, there, uh, there's always the risk of creating too much drama about these behaviors and these groups. There's also the danger of not raising awareness that they're in our environment. So we have to be judicious and be able to have conversations and preparation and understanding of what's in our midst. Slide. The art of seduction. So how do people get seduced? What, is this? How, what, what happens here? This, I, I mean, I don't mean to be simplistic about this, so I, I just summarized it, a, a pattern that, so that you can see how this works. Uh, because some people say, well, but my, my mother was such a bright human being, and she had three degrees, and she taught school, and oh my God, how did this happen? The, the cult guru's goal is to achieve spiritual, psychological, and physical control of the victim, to secure economic and sexual power over the victim. Cult gurus isolate the victim by depriving their victims of all remaining points of reference and cutting off all escape routes. The cult guru intensifies, suggests, and conditions victims with lines of argument solidifying his role as the only person that can give the victim the answer to what he or she needs. Parents, family, and church are demonized as threats to the well-being of the victim. The victim undergoes varying repetitive rites of purification, breaking down all boundaries of morality and destroying their moral compass. The rites may include repetitive diabolical music, light deprivation, and sexual assault. All conduits of communication to the outside world are eliminated, that is, telephone, television, radio, newspaper. The victims often cross into themselves and their children for the cult guru. And advanced states of seduction lead to extortion of money, criminal activities, and into extreme forms of human abuse. But you know, this, uh, the, they not only, the people of the cults not only steal from Christianity, they also steal signs and symbols and rituals from other religions. And of course, the, the Hindu community gets really upset because many of their symbols have been stolen. For example, the Kundalini uh, sign, which is the snake that lies at the base of the spinal cord, which is supposed to signify this energy. Okay, that's a different life, world, world view. So, so I'm trying to keep very open mind. Uh, that has been thought to be used by the occult to awaken clairvoyance, metanormal uh, cognition. So the imagery is the snake. And the snake sits at the base of the spinal cord. And in the occult, they want the snake to wrap itself around the spinal cord, <coughs> continue to wrap around the spinal cord. And finally, it grabs the mind and pulls the person in. That is a horrific image to me. Does that do anything to you? So, so, but of course the Hindu community, well that's not what we meant by that. That's not, that's not, they, they've taken their signs and their symbols and their rituals as well. Next. This is a, uh, this is a depiction uh, of Giotto's The Last Judgment uh, in 1303. Uh, one of the oldest depictions of Satan in Western art. And I, I found it very interesting that somehow the imagery of the, of the uh, person, the artist, is able to sort of capture the horrific modeling that they sensed in their world. And uh, judging by what I hear at bedsides about what they see, people see, have to see, in some cases, not all cases, uh, some people would argue that the person is suffering from uh, 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 some of the pain control that we're using, the morphine drip, they're hallucinating, they have extreme dementia, uh, but these things that they see are not real. But interestingly it, for me is that when people describe what they see, it's fairly similar to some of these things that you see in these paintings. Next. Spiritual toolbox. Okay, clergy. <laughs> <laughs> Weapons of choice. And lay people. Lay faithful. So here are some of the things that we use to help to cope. First of all, The Torment of St. Anthony, a great painting, is the earliest known painting by Michelangelo when he was 12 or 13 years of age. St. Anthony is being assa assailed by de in the desert by demons whose temptation he's resisted while he was undergoing trial. And you see he's being assaulted by all these demons. Interesting to me that a 12-year-old then understood this, understood diabolical assault. Don't you find that interesting? And how in the 21st century we deny it? That we think it's uh, some kind of a you know, Warner Brothers cartoon, uh, imaginary thing that Catholics sort of, sort of design. But here are some of the wonderful things that we have. We have exorcism holy water, exorcism ho uh, holy oil, blessed salt, exorcism incense, which I like for the fumigation of evil spirits. 
uh, candles, the exorcism crucifix that you see me wearing, the exorcism medal, also known as the St. Benedict medal, the miraculous medal, the bronze scapular, holy relics of saints and blesseds. And you know what? What's really powerful? Folks, Saturday, <laughs> Saturday, El Sabado, the Sacrament of Reconciliation, which people believe is the first exorcism. Oh my God, the Dominicans have this incredible opportunity for you to go to come. Now they're going to be huge lines after this session. <laughs> the, the, the Dominican friars are just looking at me like, oh my God, what is he doing? <laughs> the Holy Rosary, often used, uh, described in many beautiful ways by Marian uh, uh, spiritual writers, uh, the, the ladder to heaven or the tying of Satan's hands and ankles with the chain of the rosary. All these wonderful things. The litany of deliverance, precious blood, the renewal of baptism promises, blessings of home, vehicles, and workplaces, enthronement of the sacred heart of Jesus and the immaculate heart of Mary, St. Anthony's brief, invoking the holy names of Jesus and Mary, and living in a state of grace. We have ways that we can defend ourselves. We have holy ways, holy interventions that are at our disposal. They're not just cutesy little religious items in the, in the religious bookstore. You say, oh yeah, well Aunt Mary would like this little medal, let us get this little medal. But I also want to encourage people to get invested in the, in the scapulars and invested in the miraculous medal, go through the rituals and ceremonies associated for protecting yourself in your home. The invocation of all of the holy saints that we have at our disposal. Next. Signs of possession, of which they described in Rome as extraordinary actions of the devil. Now, I want to juxtaposition extraordinary actions of the devil with ordinary actions of the devil, which I don't have a slide for that. Because the extraordinary ones that we see in movies and read in books are pretty extraordinary and over the top. The ones that you don't see, less visible, less often, more quiet, may be present. And I find those very dangerous. But let's look at the extraordinary ones because they are dramatic. Speaking in unknown languages or understanding those who speak them. Abnormal physical strength. Knowing distant or hidden things. Aversion to the sacred. Levitation. I have seen this. I have seen people levitate. And it is unbelievable. Walking backwards on a vertical wall or upside down on a ceiling. There was recent, uh, just a, a general report in the newspaper recently that's happened in a diocese back in the, it was the Midwest. I sent you the article. Indiana. Indiana. In Indiana. And the bishop said he had never seen anything like this. A strange movement of things. Unusual loud knocking. Sounds like a hammer or rifle hitting the door or the walls. A sudden drop in temperature. Did you feel that sudden drop in temperature outside? <laughs> <laughs> That's not what I meant. <laughs> Temporary substitution of consciousness control. The brain is locked or paralyzed. Signs of demonic violence to the body, like bruises, lesions, burns, and cuts. A clearly expressed hatred toward God. Formation of objects that materialize out of nothing. Terrifying demonic nightmares. People who enthrone Satan in their homes entering into Santeria blood packs, the use of holy water sometimes triggers screams among the possessed and, burn, and burning sensations, eyes roll back, turning white, sound of simultaneous multiple guttural voices. And if you ever heard this, this is nothing on the movie. Sound of, uh, of, of snake hisses, dog barks, and lion roars coming from a human being, convulsions and contortions of the body, Uncontrollable rage, self-mutilation, windows and doors opening and closing, demonic imperson impersonations of the dead, the living God, his angels, and his saints. This is why the church must discern and study. You mean the devil comes in the appearance of the Blessed Virgin Mary and Jesus? Be careful. Speak to your priest immediately. Such manifestations, you need guidance and, and discernment. Involvement in animal and human sacrifice. The possessed often throw up metal objects like nails, rocks, and sharp objects. Desecrating of temples. Eucharistic thefts with plastic mouthpieces I told you about. 
profanation and curses at the foot of the altar, burps, piercing of arms and legs, electrical discharges, vomiting, fainting, desire to run. And one, one of the ones that I really it was amazing to me when they told this story, and, and they actually had video of this, um, it was a person slithering like a snake who had just had hip surgery, who apparently had had someone curse this person from the back of the church all the way to the front. And, and you know, when I say these things, I get some sensational, and, and you can just sort of dismiss this because it's, this is one man who saw these things. But I tell you, like God can do everything. The other things I don't want to create fear and panic among the faithful. Because God is a billion times stronger and merciful and powerful if you invoke our Lord. Next. Okay, insights from our own. Here's some advice. It's in no particular order. Look to Rome. Look to Rome. The interesting thing about the faculty is one third were doctors of different disciplines, one third were psychiatrists and psychologists, and one third were exorcists. <coughs> There's a collaboration and dialogue among the three areas of understanding. I don't see this very often in this country, but over there, they are doing this. The Catholic Church is really investigating the invisible world. Jacques Cousteau explored the deep oceans, and NASA explored outer space, but we in the church are exploring the invisible world around us. <laughs> Scan for intergenerational sin and those patterns. I'm speaking to the priest. Uh, announce the kingdom of God and the devil loses and is defeated. For some practitioners, you place a crucifix at the points of pain. Again, to the clergy. Uh, yes, uh, placing the, cru the crucifix to points of pain is useful. The exorcist or liberator must not become a public person or build a personality cult. This is the work of Jesus. This is a big mistake on those people that do this work. They're seeking cameras, lights, and actions, and notoriety. Inappropriate. This work is done discreetly. Uh, psychotherapy is useful in restructuring the human personality. Satan uses compulsive disorders and other forms of mental illness to infect a person with spiritual afflictions. And this is how one psychiatrist described it. Very interesting analogy or story, he said. I said, in my experience as a doctor, when somebody has a cut on the arm, it's subject to infection. My experience as a psychiatrist is when there's a psyche but no, 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 but all, everybody was in mental issues. I work for a mental health organization. I don't want you to generalize and universalize this. But in some cases, uh, some, some few cases, that mental illness could open up an attachment. This is why we scan for that. It's very careful. You have to be very careful with the things that I'm telling you. Do not universalize everything I'm telling you. I'm just sort of lifting that up as a possibility. Um, Guard against sabotage and infiltration. I think the American, yeah, this is my view, the American media is actively attacking the Christian tradition. A am I wrong about that? Or am I being judgmental about this? Uh, the old rite is preferred, is, is the preferred prayer of exorcism to assure diagnosis with certainty. Uh, the exorcist, Father Francisco Belmonte, who is the director of the International Association of uh, Exorcist often says, what is your name to weaken the demon and accelerate liberation? Temptations, obsessions, and possessions, infestations, disturbances, and vexations can occur concurrently. They're, they don't necessarily occur in sequence. Uh, mediums can inflict pain and wizards can foresee the future, but the power they use is the power of the dark side. So they can be very convincing. Uh, curses and spells are involved in 90% of possessed people. Cursing, it, you're placing curses and hexes on people is very commonplace. A curse is a recourse to the devil designed to cause both death and eternal death. The devil can falsify MRIs and medical tests in some cases. Recurring dreams can be, can be forms of obsessions. People use magic to, to cause and effect when God does not produce their desired results. So people are out there, I'm going to make this happen. It's going to happen. Where are the prayers? I need some of the holy water. Uh, uh, the other thing is, uh, possessed tarot card readers are particularly difficult to free, they found uh, in general. Uh, the devil impersonates the dead. Uh, 
And this was interesting teaching, and you know, it, it's often brought up in discussions, uh, and certainly in religious circles. Do our dearly departed wander the planet? Are they sort of haunting the buildings in our homes? Well, he died on this bed. I saw him the other night. What is the Catholic belief on this? What does our church teach? Does God so make people walk the planet and walk the alleyways in the street? Our church says no. Our church says it's an initial judgment immediately after death, and they are dispatched to the appropriate location. But what is walking on the planet are angels and demons. That is our teaching. Biological life is the means to eternal life. And for practitioners, one of the things that you notice during uh, the prison mass, you see the, our bishop bringing the spirit of uh, the, the Holy Spirit upon the oils. I love that to see that when the bishop does that. He's breathing the power of the Holy Spirit over the oils. And sometimes the exorcist or the liberator will do the same with somebody who's impacted by these things. Next. There are other related healing uh, ministries in the church to. Uh, D Deliverance ministry, I think you may have heard of some of these. Um, healing of the family tree, intergenerational healing, the healing of memories. There's some work done by the Catholic Charismatic Renewal, healing prayer ministry, healing and deliverance ministry, intercessory <laughs> prayer ministry, and of course the, uh, the Apostolate of Christian Renewal. This is an interesting, I think I said this before and I repeated it here. Although the devil cannot force people to people's intellect or will, he has access to the external senses and inferior faculties such as the imagination, the internal senses and memory. He can awaken images and stimulate sensations that can affect the human intellect and incline the will toward evil. So for example, uh, one of the uh, uh, priests was saying, he said, you know, I noticed in some cases that people that were very grounded in their faith had horrific images and uh, deviant images coming into their minds. And the priest said to the victim, he said, did, was some, did somebody place a curse on you? And it turned out that there was a curse placed on the person. And he says, what you must understand is that the thought is not your own. The thought is coming from the outside and is being presented to you. It's uh, impacting your, your, your understanding, your, your viewing it, thinking like, this is my thought. I own this deviancy or this profane image. And it's not, it's, they are not the personal author of this image. Interesting form of discernment. Many may feel unable to overcome negativity, fear, sorrow, anxiety, or grief, resentment, habitual sin, and compulsions, even though their minds understand that their behavior is not right. In these persistent trials, evil spirits may be at work, and healing ministries attempt to address these issues. So as in the mental health world, we see these things, and the doctors have to, re, uh, you know, they, they have recourse to medications, uh, to counseling, to group support, uh, through sitting down and diagnosing family history. The doctors are checking out the bodies, making sure that people are, have appropriate hormonal balance, that they're, they're healthy and well. And of course, the priest, you know, when we have these teams, the priest is able to also practice discernment and prayerful intercessions to understand what is happening here. And oftentimes, long before, uh, for, especially for exorcism, uh, the, uh, the, the bishop will not approve an exorcism until the psychiatrist, psychologist has cleared them, and, and the doctor has cleared them and said, we can't find the root cause for this. And then it's referred to the bishop for recourse. In, in the issues of, of uh, a person who's being impacted that's not that dramatic, but there are some elements of these things, then the priest is brought in to pray with the person and discern that way. Okay, we're getting close to the end. Let's see, where are we now? Ah, Mary, the Blessed Mother. Here are some in interesting examples of the Blessed Mother. Mary's, Mary crushes the serpent with her holy heel. You see the sacramentals of her beautiful rosary and her scapular and the miraculous medal. And it was interesting because I heard some interesting observations, um, like uh, one exorcist was saying he would ask the possessed person uh, which particular image of the Blessed Mother was most, of course it's the same Blessed Mother, so we don't, we don't want to play games here with the Blessed Mother, it's the same, same beautiful mother of ours. But he did say that, that in the Eastern Rite, Our Lady of Holy Protection was used quite often. 
And in our tradition, the entire of knots became particularly effective. Anybody, uh, 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 raise your hands if you've heard of the devotion to the married the, uh, married the entire of knots. Some of you are aware of it. It's a very powerful, beautiful devotion to the Blessed Mother. Next, St. Joseph. Wow. Do we ever hear about St. Joseph in our church anymore? Yes. We do. I love that title, St. Joseph, Terror of Demons. I want him on my side. <laughs> Don't you? Patron of the Universal Church, Terror of Demons, Patron of a Happy Death, Patron of Interior Souls, Co-Patron of, of Vatican City. As you know, also known as Joseph of Nazareth, Joseph the Artisan, Joseph the Betrothed, and Joseph the Worker. I love this, this quotation. This is from a real seer, and she was healed, she was possessed. I was a seer, and now I see. How beautiful is that? Next. Of course, we always know about St. Michael the Archangel, supreme enemy of Satan, Christian angel who accompanies us at the hour of death, weighs our souls on Judgment Day, patron and protector of the Holy Roman Catholic Church, co-patron of Vatican City, princess of the Seraphim, patron of grocers, mariners, paratroopers, police, and people who are ill, and leader of the army of God. What a wonderful angel is he. Is he not a wonderful, incredible angel? I hope you all invoke, say the prayer to St. Michael the Archangel. Next, aha, uh -huh. who is this? Another deacon. We're not surprised. Another deacon. St. Syriacus, deacon and martyr, and he's the patron of exorcists. And it really was wonderful to discover him. The three past presidents of the International Association of Exorcists really recommend him. St. Syriacus, for those of you who pray to the 14 holy helpers, will, will recognize his name. He's the first exorcist in the Roman Rite. His patronage includes, of course, exorcists, diabolical possession, epilepsy, and eye diseases. <coughs> He's the patron saint of the Comune de Torre, the Nocel, I mispronounced the Italian. The holy relics are kept at Santa Maria in Via Latte in Rome, and the, the beautiful city of Le Nocel, and of course the abbey in Aldor, France. Uh, Syriacus is also venerated in the Eastern Orthodox Church on the 7th of July, and in the Roman Catholic Church on August the 8th. This saint, holy priest of God, priests, bishops, and priests, and, and deacons should really reactivate their understanding of this particular saint. And when exorcists are doing, or, and even for people that are doing prayers of liberation, this particular saint is particularly powerful. And I have to say that I did not know this saint. I got reacquainted, I saw, remember seeing the, the name on the list of the 14 holy helpers. It's a beautiful saint. And uh, to my great surprise and my prayerful discernment about wanting to make sure that he was on my side, I managed, with God's help, to have a first-class holy relic of St. Syriacus. And I have that with me tonight. And it's my hope to bless you with this holy relic of St. Syriacus. I am so happy that I was managed to be able to get that. Next, aha, the Catholic calendars, old and new, we have a list of the exorcist saints and blessings. Here they are. This is the complete list of all those that people invoke. This is an incredible list of the exorcist saints and blessings. And your pastor loves this list. He says, give me that list. <laughs> Saints Iriakos, Saint Andrew Avellino, Saint Anthony of the Desert, Saint Benedict, Saint Bruno. The servant of God, Candido Amantino, he's buried in the Holy Stairs across the, from the, the, the Lateran. Blessed Matteo of Ag Agnoni, Saint Dionysus, Saint Diphna, Saint Gemma Galgani. Are you surprised by seeing Padre Pio there? No. no. Blessed John Paul II, yay. Saint Michael the Archangel, Saint Paulinus, Saint Tecla, and Saint Vicinio. Okay, next. Now what's happening today that's interesting and exciting in this area of ministry? I am excited to tell you these things. I have never publicly presented this information before. And it's not well known outside of Europe. So Padre Cipriano de Mayo is uh, the uh, second president of the association. He's now in his 80s. 
And he is a Capuchin Franciscan, and he lives in Cerro Capriola. And he, uh, Blessed Matteo de Agnoni, is an, was a powerful exorcist of his time. And what is happening here is that people who have been possessed and people have been working with spiritual affliction, they're trying to break it, the person, trying to, to heal the person, and they can't seem to do it. <coughs> he takes them to the tomb, and our, our wonderful Blessed Matteo, somehow, we don't understand it casts the possession out of the person as they bring him close to the tomb. And he is escorting a woman. You see her head is thrown back, and it's taking place now as we speak. This, this sit still is going on in Europe, in Cerro Capriola, and it's my hope to be going there this April to visit him. I've been on the phone with him. Another one that's quite interesting is Saint Vicinius, a saint of, of 330. He was the bishop of, uh, of that city. And it was a very interesting man. He was really hermetical. He was a hermit. He did not want to be bishop. He wanted to live in the cave like Benedict. Leave me alone. I don't want to be with God. And yet the Pope decided, no, no, you're going to be the bishop. And so what he would do is he would live at the top of the mountain, and then he'd come down to the city. Oftentimes he would wear a neck piece, a piece of metal with a weight, doing penance for the people he pastored. What happened in years later, you can see the body there on the, on the lower uh, right-hand side. And you see the neck piece that he used to wear. And what they do is the people at the Cathedral of Sarsina, actually all the priests there are exorcists in the tradition of this bishop. And people show up and they place the collar around the neck and pray over people that come to visit. I'm also going to visit there. I'll come back and report out. <laughs> Another interesting person is Padre Gabriel Amorth. Some of you may know of his books. Uh, incredible man, uh, leader in this field. Uh, he uh, has terrible health problems. Is he still doing the work? Wonderful holy man. I had such a wonderful opportunity to be blessed by him. And uh, a great, great man. And here's the servant of God, Candido Amantino, who was a master exorcist at the Scala Sancta who people go there, they go to the, the Holy Stairs to pray, and they crawl up on the stairs, right? How many of you know the Skull of Sangha, the Holy Stairs in Rome? People go to pray because these are the stairs where Jesus carried, you know, was, was walking up the stairs during the Passion. And his body is buried there, and people go pray to him for intercession. So these are some of the exciting things that are happening in the church today around exorcism. You find this interesting? Yes. OK, slide. OK. Some false assumptions. Beware of people who use logic and their intellect to destroy your faith. And here are some of the, uh, the arrows, slings and arrows that will be thrown at you. The exorcist is one more wizard. That's all that he is. Jesus is just one more prophet. Evil is a pathology that it can be cured and overcome by science and technology. Do you believe that? Do what you want. All is relative, there are no limits. I am God. Sounds like Lucifer, no? In the name of freedom, we do not respect the freedom of others. This is what the Catholic world is experiencing right now in this country. What you like is good. Demons are friends of humanity. Evil is a human deficiency. There is no personification of evil, i.e. the devil. Jesus Christ is not the only way, the only truth, and the only life. White witchcraft is good. Since we cannot analyze or measure God, there is no God. Science is the last word on truth. Religions are to be viewed as myths, according to Joseph Campbell, and metaphors and fables. He's a brilliant, was a brilliant man. Actually, he was an ex-Catholic. There is no absolute truth. Everyone has their own truth. What do you think of those assaults on our, on our faith? Beware. Next. Anybody see this in the news last week? I hope you saw it. Earlier this month, the Satanic Temple in New York announced that they have applied to build a seven-foot-tall statue depicting Satan with a goat head, horns, wings, and a beard in Oklahoma's capital. 
They made the move in the aftermath of the Ten Commandments monument being installed there. According to a spokesperson or spokesman from the temple, the statue will, be, will have a functional purpose as a chair where people of all ages may sit on the lap of Satan for inspiration and contemplation. This is last, in the, within the last month. This is ongoing right now. Do you notice the, ch the children on either side of Satan's lap? <coughs> you think that we are exaggerating about this? Um, they, you know, the one thing I, I notice about Catholic Christians, those that have problems, and, and oh yeah, but Deacon, yeah, but you know, where you live in a civil society, live and let live, just let them do that. It, we don't go to their, their, their temple. Let us let them do what they want. You know what? They are determined. They believe their system with a passion of fire. They're on fire with their satanic cult. They are flying with it. They are fervent. Are we? Are we on fire with our faith? Are we as determined to, put, to lift up the cross? Lift up the cross and I say I am a Catholic Christian? I ask you the question, and I'll let you answer it to your God. Next. Advice. The holy name of Jesus saves us from innumerable evils and delivers us especially from the power of the devil, who is constantly seeking to do us harm. Flee every work of the devil. Do not listen to horoscopes or oracles of those who speak through magic filters or call on spirits. Avoid excess in sin. Do not use spells when sick. Go to the doctor and not to the magicians. Do not spend too much time in doubtful places. This is from, again, the year 300. And finally, I think we're almost at the end. Oh my God, I love this, this, this wonderful, Jesus is exorcist. You know this prayer, this psalm. Let God rise up. Let his enemies be scattered. Let those who hate him flee before him. As smoke is driven away, so drive them away. As the wax melts before the fire, let the wicked perish before God. Okay, next. Almost at the final slide. And here is uh, Father Francisco Bamonte, president of the International Association of Exorcists, and myself at the annual Exorcism and Prayer of Liberation course. And he's a holy, holy, holy man. And he is at the front lines of this ministry. He's at the front lines. I encourage the priests that are here with us to take the course if you can. And it will feel a, a kind of empowerment you've never had before because I, I, tell, I go to Rome to do courses and this one really touched me because I've been doing this ministry for a long time in isolation, as many of us who do this. And he was, he's a, an incredible human being. And finally, I think it's really important that we do this work in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Spirit, who is our God of love. He is here. He is our genesis, he is our journey, and he is our destiny. Know that, pray that, be with that. Critically important. And yet I want to thank my, my, my wonderful host, the Dominican Fathers here at, at the uh, uh, parish. And I want to thank the clergy who is with us this evening. I, I am so proud to be part of your community. Uh, I also want to tell you that, that uh, the lay faithful the holy people of God is the reason that we do this ministry, and we do it together. And you minister to us as well. Just know that. You bear witness as to why God loves us so deeply. And so today I do have Saint Syriacus, who is this incredible, uh, holy, beautiful saint who defends us in battle against the wicked snares of the devil. And with him I have a multiple of uh, the exorcists, saints and blesses in holy relics. And, uh, and, and I'm sure my nephew will tell you that I am relic crazy. <laughs> I love the holy saints and blessed and venerables. And so this evening we're going to uh, give you a special blessing for healing and protection. And so uh, please bow your heads for God's blessing through his saints, the exorcist saints. And I lift high the holy saints, St. Saint Syriacus and all of his brothers and sisters who do battle on behalf of humanity, knowing that they are here to assist us. And so I bless you in the name of St. Syriacus and the exorcist saints, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.
Sure. And if any of you are experiencing any kind of disturbance, uh, please see me right after this, and I'll give you a, a specific blessing. Thank you so much. God bless you.